Hey everyone, I posted on some social media recently that I was fortunate enough to help with um, refining the exams for the collaboration, CCMP collaboration, which will be coming out in February 2020. And I requested approval to be able to make a video about some of the workshops that I've worked on for the exams. Like in previous years, I actually wrote exam questions for the CCMP and CCNA collaboration. But this year, I actually worked on validating the exam and going through it and providing feedback and refining the questions. And in the end, we also wrote a few questions as well. With that said, I'd also like to mention that I will be one of the co-authors for the um, implementing Cisco Advanced Call Control and Mobility Services exam, which is the test number 300-815. I recently learned that with being one of the authors, I'll get five free copies of the book, and I intend on doing some giveaways when I get those copies. I also did some other giveaways recently where I gave away a Raspberry Pi Canna kit, which was the Raspberry Pi 4 4 gig um, kit. And I also gave away a Raspberry Pi 3, which included the Adafruit LCD screen already functioning and a case for that. And those two different items went to folks um, that were overseas in Europe. One was in the Netherlands and the other gentleman was in Germany. So if you like the content on my channel, and you're interested in some of the giveaways, please feel free to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon so you know when I'm putting out videos. And also, uh, please, if you know anybody that would benefit from the videos that I'm creating, uh, share them so that other people can also get the information that I'm putting out there. Let's transition back to the exams. Um, as somebody who has gone through multiple Cisco exams, I know that there are some frustrating items when you're in the exam room. And with that said, this particular site here is where you can go to give feedback about the exams. And if you would like to actually have more of an impact on the exams, there's the Cisco Certification Subject Matter Expert Program, and this is where they're recruiting people. You can read about the program here. They give things like uh, when you've met your, your goals in the program, you can extend your certification. I've heard of them actually giving people exam vouchers, or maybe you can get a Cisco Press book. So there's different things there, but if you read around on the different websites, the only thing that they actually mention is uh, an extension of whatever certifications you, you um, are working on for the exam. Now, if you wanted to join the program, you could click here and they have the option to apply now. But if we go back to the other site, you can read about the different qualifications and requirements to be um, considered as one of the exam SMEs where you're going to create content. And this is, this is good. The reason why this is good is because um, some of the complaints that I've seen on social media, people talk about in when I took exam X or I took exam Y, I was being asked questions that are really not out in the, uh, about products that are really not out in the wild anymore. You know, products that have been EOL, you know, end of life, um, end of support. And though some customers may still use it for the most part, they're just not out in production anymore. So, uh, essentially what they're saying is that the exam is not keeping up with market trends or product support. And if we go back to, the page here and we look at the exam overview or sorry the program overview they even talk about that um, customer input and candidate input uh, people who are, are certified their input is very valuable in making sure that we have quality exams so the reason why i'm showing this is that 
for years, I didn't even know that this was a thing. I, had, I, I didn't even think about who might be writing exam questions. I didn't think about how do they get recruited into being SMEs that write exam questions. This whole program was just unknown to me. So I just wanted to make sure that visibility of this program is being put out there and um, people can go apply for it. Furthermore, I wanted to talk about this site here, which I'll put all these different links up. This is um, some of the frequently asked questions. They wrote this document. I don't know when, I couldn't see a date on it. But from what I could see, the few, the few um, items that I read look to be still relevant. Let's now go ahead and actually get into uh, the exam life cycle based on the visibility, the limited visibility that I've had so far. In the past, I've written questions for exams and those questions needed to be directly tied to an item on the blueprint. So that lets us know that the blueprint is the first thing that needs to be created so that we can know what type of questions to write. And I've not yet taken place, taken part in developing the blueprint, um, but I can tell you that it is very, very, very important for studying the Cisco exams. And that again is because each question needs to tie back to a specific item on the blueprint. And I remember when I was writing the questions, it, they would give you different um, like alphanumeric assignments. So I would say, you know, um, section two, subsection 2.1 is going to be, I don't know, Cisco emergency responder, which is not on any exam. I'm using that example on purpose because I don't even want to come close to putting something out there that's questionable in terms of the non-disclosure agreement, which when you look at all this stuff, you'll see that you have to sign non-disclosure agreements to participate in the program. So let's say that that particular section deals with tracking phones in Cisco emergency responder. You would then have to go and write uh, however many questions they tell you for that section. And then you would get another assignment as well. And that one would be for, I don't know, um, a particular feature like device mobility, let's say, which I'm not sure if there's any questions on that. I'd have to go back and look at the blueprint again. I pretty much purged my memory about what questions were on the test. Um, but if we look at device mobility, they could say, um, <clears throat> You know, write X amount of questions about that. And so that's that's where that goes. The, the exam questions being created are all tied back to the blueprint. And another thing that I learned in that workshop that I was a part of is that we were required to write questions which could be found in documentation. So each question that we wrote, we also had to provide links to the documentation and the specific section that our question uh, was written based off of. So those were two key topics that I've learned from working with um, the workshop where we were creating content, creating questions. It absolutely tied back to the blueprint. If it's not on the blueprint, you don't write a question about it. And we were writing questions which could be found in either an official cert guide or an S or D or some sort of configuration or system guide. Now this year, um, 2019, I got to participate in the workshop where we actually go in and take the exams and review the questions, provide feedback, work on the feedback, take action against the feedback and refine the exam. So the first thing that needed to happen is that I needed to sign the non-disclosure agreement. And after signing the non-disclosure agreement, eventually I was given access to a site, which I believe is called exam developer or something like that. I don't remember the portal name, but you log into the portal and whatever exams are there ready for you to review, you go in and you actually take them. It, it, it feels as if you're in there taking the actual exam because you are. 
Um, you don't get to see the right answers at that point in time, which is good because if you go in and you look at a question and they tell you which one's the right answer, you may look at it and say, okay, yeah, that makes sense to me. And say like, this question is easy and not give any feedback. So actually trying to have to think through the question and choose the right answer forces you to be able to give good feedback. At the end of the exam, I actually did get grades. Like your total score is X. Um, and the feedback is sent back to the team who does all of the exam creation. The next thing we did was a lot of us met here in the RTP North Carolina Cisco campus. And it was a big workshop, multiple different rooms filled up with people. Uh, some folks joining remotely over WebEx. So I don't really know who all was a part of the program. I, I know that there's people that come in to write the exam questions. And I know that there were people in the room with me from all different places. And then um, I know that there were people on the WebEx, which I'm, I'm not even too sure who all it was. But what we would do, the first thing we did, day one, um, we did more training on what creates a good exam question and what not to do, what, what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing in the exam questions. And then we went into the feedback that was uh, provided for the different exam questions. And everybody would review the feedback and review the question. And then we would modify the question based on the feedback, or maybe even sometimes we would scrap the question altogether and create a new one. Some of the things that when I'm taking an, an exam throw me off is um, if the question is not written in a full sentence or if there's typos or a word missing, stuff like that kind of throws me off. It makes me have to read the question two or three times. And I don't really appreciate that because it's not that it's a difficult question. It's not that it's a difficult topic. It's simply that it's a poorly written question. So we looked a lot for things like that. That's just some of the low level stuff that we look for, non-technical type of items that we look for. We also took, kept an eye out for identifying questions that were asked in, in such a way that um, let's say if there's only supposed to be one right answer in certain scenarios, then there might be two, two of the answers in the list of possible answers might be correct. However, it says choose one. So what we would do in those scenarios is either we would um, make sure that one of the options that could possibly be correct was removed or we provided additional detail in the question that would essentially remove the possibility of the second option being correct as well, therefore leaving truly only one correct answer. And another thing that we did was made sure that we weren't teaching in the exam. So let's say for Cisco collaboration, you have to know about things like voice codecs. Um, and I'm not saying that for the exam, I'm just saying for if you are a senior collaboration engineer, then you should know about um, voice codecs. So we didn't want to go in and ask an exam question where we say something like, um, there are many different voice codecs, such as G711, G722, G729, ILBC, and they all have different levels of com complexity and compression ratios and all this different stuff. Um, which codec would provide you with an 8K compression ratio, whatever it might be? In that scenario, we would be, we, we would be just putting a lot of fluff into it, essentially wasting somebody's time in the exam. And so we made sure that we weren't teaching in the exam rather than saying there's all these different codecs and here are some of them. And you know, they have different complexity. We would just go straight to which codec provides you with eight kilobits per second, um, of bandwidth consumption for a call. Right. Um, and I don't believe that's a question on the exam. Again, I've purged my mind. So don't go looking at like, Oh, I need to go learn all these different things, right? Just look at the blueprint, look at the official cert guides, go through training courses, do labs, stuff like that. Do that for your study and don't try to study based off what I'm saying in this video. But, um, again, we tried to take out a lot of the fluff and just go straight to asking the question that needed to be asked. We also would look for making sure that there's rele relevant topics. So, um, 
if our product was coming into play, which was not really all that relevant anymore, we would try to make sure that didn't happen. Um, if certain protocols were coming in for maybe, um, you know, interconnecting protocols, then we would try to make sure that the protocol was actually on the blueprint and actually still relevant in the field. And the last thing that I want to mention, which is another big one, is that we tried to make sure that things weren't tied to specific versions. For example, um, let's say MGCP. I don't remember what version of CUCM or call manager, uh, whatever you want to call it. I don't remember what version MGCP support came into play, but at some point, CUCM hadn't supported MGCP and at some point it started supporting it. So if we were to ask a question in what version did MGCP support first become implemented into CUCM, that could very quickly become a question that um, is no longer relevant. So we tried not to tie questions to software versions. And then at the end of the workshop, when we had gone through the different exams, we had gone through the feedback, um, what we ended up doing was again, going back through all of the exams questions um, and giving them a percentage of the likelihood that a minimally qualified candidate would get the question right. And then if the percentage was too high based off of their criteria, I don't know what it is exactly, what the thresholds are, but if, if it was too high of a percentage, percentage like everyone's gonna get the question right, then um, we would have to revisit the question. And if the percentage was too low, meaning a lot of people are going to get the question wrong, then we would again revisit those questions because you didn't want to have an exam with just giveaway questions, but you also don't want to have an exam where nobody's going to get this right. So if somebody is meeting the, whatever's the um, minimally qualified candidate, which there's actually um, guidelines around what the minimally qualified candidate is, um, so we just really want to make sure that uh, people are able to pass the exams if they come in with the minimal qualifications. We don't want to make it so easy that people are just passing it. We don't want to make it so hard that people don't even want to take it because no matter how hard they study, they're just not passing the exam. So the goal is to have a high quality exam, which people are able to pass if they are doing the proper studying. Um, and it actually stays with market trends and tests people at the appropriate level so that people can walk away feeling like their exam, their certification is actually worth something. And so that other folks out there can have an expectation of what level of knowledge the person, the certificate holder actually has. So again, if you have feedback about your exam experiences, specifically about the format of the exams, the questions, um, how you feel about the questions, like maybe you feel as though they weren't well written or maybe they, they were confusing or that the answers weren't appropriate feel free to go to the support page and provide that feedback so that it can be acted upon. Also, again, if you like the content, please uh, give a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and share the videos with anybody that could uh, possibly find some sort of value or might be interested in the content that I'm provi providing.